You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitate at support meetings for families and individuals who have been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Wesley Yang, an essayist and public intellectual, has written extensively about 21st century America and the liminal position of the non-Black, non-white person. Coining the term successor ideology in 2019, Wesley has carefully analyzed this particular kind of ideology among left-wing movements that is centered around identity politics. Wesley has recently turned his attention towards gender issues, and in this episode, he delivers a blistering analysis of how gender has become a socio-political juggernaut, infiltrating society in every possible way. His substack features his writing and the writing of other authors who are covering all the shocking twists and turns in the gender debates. He's also covering the release of the new WPATH standards of care and the subsequent talks given about various chapters, including the now infamous Eunuch chapter. As you'll hear, Wesley has a truly incisive mind and a dynamic voice, and we're so thrilled he's pointing his attention towards pediatric gender transition and the horrible treatment that parents receive when they simply attempt to protect their children. So we will just let him speak for himself. And here is Wesley Yang. Hi, Sasha. Hi, Stella. We are joined by Wesley Yang. We are really glad to have you today. Good morning. How are you? Uh, I'm well. Thanks so much for having me. So where do we go? Begin. Yeah, I think we should start kind of more towards the beginning. Of course, you've been covering a lot more recently about gender, which our listeners, I'm sure, will want to hear about. But tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you're you're a writer. And how did you kind of find your way into the world of heterodox thinking and all of that? Sure. Um, so I have a kind of not that dramatic uh, path into being a writer. Um, uh, I I graduated or I finished four years of, uh, I finished uh, sort of eight semesters of being a college student at Rutgers University, which is the state university uh, of New Jersey. Uh, Back in 1997, I didn't have a degree. Uh, I went to work for a kind of local uh, weekly newspaper. I was making $12,000 a year. It's a newspaper that they kind of throw on your uh, sidewalk for free. Uh, I did that for a year. I went to a um, a daily newspaper in the same kind of suburban New Jersey area covering basically sort of NIMBY politics and suburban politics and uh, that sort of thing, you know, sort of, you know, covering local town councils, uh, police blotters, and, uh, you know, the real, the rudiments of reporting. Um, but, you know, I had, uh, I had, uh, you know, uh, intellectual ambition. So I wanted to write for publications like the New York Review of Books. I had no idea how to do that. But I had a friend who started writing for a publication called Feed Magazine, which was one of the early webzines. And uh, and, and that kind of, and he, he let me sort of tag along and meet some people in the New York City milieu of writers, uh, one of whom started a publication called N Plus One. Um, which was at the time a kind of feeder publication into the, uh, the the mainstream press. And back then, things were very different. Uh, there, there was no social media. Uh, there was a tiny handful of people, most of whom had graduated from Ivy League colleges that worked at all of the major New York City newspapers and publications. And you could not break in. You had to toil away for a decade into your 30s, right, as a fact checker or as a As an editorial assistant, there was uh, really no other way into it. Um, But uh, N plus one became a kind of uh, farm team for those publications. And then I wrote an essay called The The Face of Sung Wee Cho back in uh, 2007. And that was my first piece in N plus one. And it became kind of a, a phenomenon within the, 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 the sort of the world, the small world of people that, that decide, you know, who gets into New York Magazine. And then I was recruited to write a piece for New York Magazine, uh, which uh, in 2011, 
Uh, and so I was on my way as a, a magazine writer, and pretty much all I have ever done since then is write one piece after the next uh, and have done nothing else uh, with my life. So your your talent got you there. Um, could you tell us about that essay? Because th- that's a really kind of defining moment, really, for, for your career, but anyway, for an understanding of, of this new new kind of thing that has arrived in 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 our world in the last 20 odd years yeah so you know the essay was about um what was at the time uh the largest uh mass shooting uh in uh, american history i believe uh, and it was by this kind of asian american uh uh college student who had some uh mental difficulties uh and but he had done some things that were kind of unique to the internet age which is that he had created a manifesto and and filmed some videos of himself and then sent them off to, you know, various television networks. And, you know, his manifesto was a crazy document, but it also kind of, uh, you know, expressed this fantasy of a sort of uh, coalition of losers uh, and not defined in uh, racial terms or not defined in any terms that had to, that fit within the various rubrics of the identity politics of its time. And so one of the interesting facets of the story that I talk about is that he was a creative writing student at Virginia Tech, and he was a student of a, in the class of a woman named Nikki Giovanni. And uh, Nikki Giovanni was a black nationalist poet. And uh, among her works, uh, which I quoted at length in my essay, uh, was, uh, you know, it was a famous black nationalist uh, poem that, among other things, said, you know, can you can you piss on a blonde head? Can you chop it off? Can you? So it was a kind of it was a kind of um, the argument that it made to, to the extent that it had one. Uh, and it used the N word uh, repeatedly um, was to say that, oh, black people are always killing each other. Why are we not waging war on the rest of society? Um, and And so I make this distinction in the essay between. A kind of uh, you know black nationalist revolt that 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 was legible, and that people understood what it meant, and that and that had uh, that could be perceived as literature. Whereas there was this other kind of revolt of the losers of the sexual outcasts um, that 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 Cho uh, represented that that was not that was not legible that was that was simply mental illness uh, but it was also a fantasy of a community of those who were rejected for reasons that were not sort of uh, recognized by our system of identity identity politics and also that you know he was an asian man put puts him in a kind of liminal stage as a, as someone who has a claim uh, on people's sympathies as a, as an oppressed and downtrodden person. And these are the things that I kind of dealt with. I don't exactly resolve them in the essay, but I kind of go through them and I posit the existence of this kind of revolt of the otherwise undesirable. <laughs> and I say, oh, this will never happen. Right. Uh, you know, because because the undesirable don't have solidarity by virtue of the fact that they are undesirable. Uh, and 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 uh, of course, I was quite uh, mistaken. And in, in 2018, when this essay was collected into a book, um, you know, I uh, called uh, The Souls of Yellow Folk, um, I did an introduction where I say, well, why are we publishing this essay again? Why is it relevant today? And has it is there a, a reason to read this essay uh, in light of the way the culture has changed over the last 10 years? And the answer I came up with uh, uh, with regard to my own essays is that, yes, it's actually more relevant than ever before. Uh, and very interesting to look back at the kind of proto-identity politics of the time through the lens of the... Um, you know, the uh, social justice activism on the one hand, and then the, uh, you know, the alt-right activism on the other hand, two internet phenomenon where you had these different groups uh, coalescing around uh, a kind of inchoate um, identity um, that, that, uh, that was seeking to obtain power in the world. And of course, this was a couple of years into the Trump victory, which was perceived by some, I think not wrongly, as a kind of, as a kind of, um, dispute over our gendered and our racial constitution. Um, and, 
You know, the essay was written at a time it's, uh, you know, in advance of many of the developments, but that seemed to presage many of those developments. And so the, you know, Cho kind of straddles this line. On the one hand, obviously, he is a kind of, you know, violent, uh, vindictive, uh, vengeful, uh, you know, male fascist, uh, you know, fascistic uh, impulse taken to its furthest extent. But at the same time, there are these, you know, there are these uh, arguments that everyday life is a matrix of oppression for persons like himself that also are echoed on the other side. And and so we have these kind of, you know, we have these kind of mirror images uh, of themselves that um, of, of a kind of, uh, you know, mirror images of racial and gender depression, uh, you know, um, from, from, from different points of view. And, and sort of, we have a group that we have the group that is kind of denied, uh, any recognition as those who are sufferers like, uh, you know, men and, and white people, uh, and presented as, you know, dogmatically presented as the oppressors. Um, uh, and in a configuration such, you know, such as that, it, it also seems inevitable that, those groups will also develop their own, uh, you know, politics of online grievance and identity formation. So both of those things were happening at, at 2018. Um, at the time, uh, we had not yet institutionalized one of them, right? But it turns out that we were in the process of institutionalizing one of them. And, and so the kind of language of Tumblr around non-binary identities, um, you know, created in academia, I think in the, in the two thousands, you may know this history a little bit more than I do. Uh, but then, but then kind of injected into the cultural bloodstream through Tumblr and other social media entities, uh, in the early 2010s, uh, now is in the process of being institutionalized at the level of the, you know, the United States civil rights states, it's, it's, uh, it's human resources department. And so this is where I come in making a kind of, you know, what is perceived to be a heterodox turn, although it's not a really a departure from uh, the way I went about looking at these uh, things in the past. It's just that the culture has evolved so much. And we have seen that process that I just referred to of a, of an institutionalization, right, of these categories, because the people who are on Tumblr in 2013 you know, now are the, they're not quite the executive director of the, you know, of whatever, but they are the, they are the executive assistant to the executive director of uh, various uh, nonprofit institutions that are responsible for our bureaucratic language. And they are, they are in a position, it turns out to be the case, um, to engage in junior employee activism that is responsible for the transformation of official bureaucratic language we see across various, uh, you know, like the Women's March, you know, they recently sort of tweeted, this is just one example that I, that happened across, uh, you know, this is happening nearly every day. You know, if your feminism is not intersectional, it is, you know, it is not feminism. Um, you know, claims like this, um, you happen all the time. We have the ACLU. Um, I think they, they, uh, you know, they edited language. They edited a quote by Ruth, Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg in order to make it, uh, sort of gender, right? Um, yeah, gender inclusive, uh, to kind of remove the reference that she made to women. Um, and so, you know, those kind of, uh, Tumblr online social justice warriors, uh, made a very what turned out to be very quick, it wasn't even a long march through institutions. All they had to do was show up, be the people in the pipeline, be the most uh, passionate people, and they could make the institutions that are responsible for our kind of shared bureaucratic official reality um, engage in a process of root and, and branch transformation of our understanding of human nature and biological reality uh, in just the course of a handful of years. Um, and so for me, you know, I began, uh, saying, well, okay, I occupy this kind of liminal position as a non-black, non-white person in a culture that is racially polarized between white and black. And, uh, and, and of course we're, we're in the process of, um, we're, you know, America is in the process of kind of metabolizing 
the fact that over the last 30 years, we have been integrating, um, there has been mass integration, immigration to this country of mostly non-black, non-white diversity. And so the way that I see this is that the politics of MAGA, right, the kind of backward looking politics of a, you know, of a kind of reassertion of white identity. Um, and then the politics of what I refer to as the equity agenda, right? Um, um, are really, uh, are really about, are really about, um, trying to resolve the question of which way, right, our non-black, non-white diversity is going to go. It's the, and it's, it's, it's Hispanics and, and Asian Americans who actually hold the balance. Um, and, um, and, and, and both of these groups have an interest in rejecting both MAGA and the equity agenda, right? Because between the years 2014 and 2019, the group whose income uh, grew the fastest were Hispanics. And the group whose incomes who grew the next fastest were uh, Asian Americans. So the most kind of economically dynamic groups in the country and the most and the demographically growing groups in this country. Uh, so, uh, oh, okay. Um, are America's non-white, non-black diversity, uh, but these very kind of uh, extremist framings uh, of that diversity are the ones that, you know, have, have risen to the fore in the last few years, um, uh, you know, with a kind of, uh, you know, with a kind of slavery focused, you know, view of American history, which was always a kind of, alternative to an immigrant focused view of American history. Right. Um, and because in fact, <laughs> and, uh, you know, sorry, it's actually immigrants that built the country, right. If you're, if you're going to talk about after the 20th century, uh, it was European immigrants and it is now other kinds of immigrants, um, who, you know, who, who are, you know, who, who are the decisive factor, but there is this ideological war, this very polarized ideological mm -hmm. war, uh, going on, and the uh, and there's a there's a there's a kind of moral revolution from above that is in the process of being installed within our schools. And that moral revolution of from above um, holds that, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, society, American society is a matrix of oppression of the, you know, of the black, of the white over the non-white and of the male over the female and of the cis over the the trans and of the straight over the gay. Um, and. You know, so it's an intersectional theory that tries to link everything to a kind of unitary uh, oppressive essence. And the reason that it does that is, you know, is it's the only way that you can hold together these very disparate groups of people who have nothing in common other than the fact that they aren't white males. Um, and so this is the politics that, you know, when 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 we are. Uh, the, the, you know, new teachings about race and then also new teachings about gender. And there's a reason why all of these uh, beliefs uh, move in lockstep together um, mm -hmm. because there's a, there, there's a kind of coalitional politics dimension to it. Uh, and then there's also a class of people who are committed to that, the proposition that I just made, right? There's a, there's a class, yeah. it's a kind of jobs program, right? For a, a certain kind of uh, college graduate, uh, most of them mm -hmm. overwhelmingly female who, you know, who in gender studies departments and in, and in, uh, identitarian studies, uh, departments, um, you know, we, we, we minted thousands of such people who, uh, who, who grew up in these kind of online, uh, sort of academic echo chambers, um, and their beliefs were never tested by, uh, you know, empirical reality, but they were able to, to, to create these, they were able to manufacture these consensuses among themselves by having journals to themselves that, that, and, and peer reviewers who were only accountable to their own dogmas. Um, and they created a whole body of, they hold, they, they hold, they created a whole body of grievance and of, and of, you know, for them, what counts as knowledge. So a universe of citations where they're able to say things such as, you know, the gender binary was invented by Western colonialists and, you know, imposed on indigenous people who were gender fluid and, and gender queer by by default. This is, you know, this is a kind of quarter truth, right? I mean, there's not nothing yeah. to it. But, you know, because because, you know, Christian missionaries, right, you know, did have 
particular moral beliefs that they, you know, imposed yes. on the nations that they conquered and they dominated among them that, you know, you, that you shouldn't, uh, you know, throw widows onto the pyre, right, with their, and so there's examples of that. And also like, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't keep human beings as slaves and they, and they put an end to that. Um, and they did have certain Victorian ideas, right, about gender that may have been more rigid than the societies in which they, uh, you know, in which they uh, colonize. But this, of course, does not mean <laughs> right that those that those societies did not have their own gender binary and in fact you know these kind of third sexes that you find are a function of uh, gender binaries that are far more strict than western gender binaries uh because because um they they create that third category as a way to deal with you know to deny the existence of same sex desire to, to deny the existence of homosexuality and so on it's a much more you know th sure there's a real conversation that we can have here to turn it into this dogmatic statement that, you know, the gender binary is a form of whiteness that we must struggle against. That is right. That is a that is a propagandistic talking point that has some iota of truth to it, um, but but not one that anyone who really understands the issue is going to take seriously. And yet, you know, views like this, um, you know, are, are accepted as axiomatic. Right. In in, you know, among those who, uh, ex, you know, who buy into this complex of ideas that I've just described that does not really have a name or it has a variety of, you know, kind of diffuse and inchoate names, critical social justice, you know, critical pedagogy. Uh, you know, th there are hostile names for it, postmodern neo-Marxism. Um, but I wanted a term that was fairly neutral sounding. And so I sort of coined one while I was, uh, you know, on Twitter, and I call it a successor ideology. And when successor ideology sort of underscores the fact that it is a, that it is something that moves beyond liberalism. And it, uh, but it shares, it sort of originates out of liberalism, it grows out of it, but it turns out to annul many of its values in the process. So in the same way that like Marxism is a kind of successor ideology to liberalism, Marxism says that, you know, so liberalism promised freedom and equality, but, but, but it produced uh, massive economic inequality. And so what we're going to do is we're going to realize the unfulfilled promises of liberalism. Um, in fact, through the, you know, through the dictatorship of the proletariat, right? And so social justice, uh, successor ideology is similar in, is a successor ideology in the sense that it says, um, oh, you promised freedom and equality. That's what liberalism does. But in fact, there are all of these differences and hierarchies between people and the distinctive uh, the distinctive category of a successor, or the distinctive thing that sets a successor ideology apart is that it begins to reinterpret distinctions between better and worse, distinctions between health and unhealth as themselves product of oppression. And so if you were to create a movement to create awareness around like treating like overweight people with kindness, um, that would be a kind of traditional liberal humanism. Successor ideology says that, in fact, it is the psychological harm that is done by telling people that BMI is correlated, right, with, uh, you know, higher degrees of, uh, you know, bad health outcomes. Um, the, the, the harm that is done by stating this empirical fact is worse than the harms that are done by having a b higher BMI, right? When you actually attack the uh, knowledge-seeking and knowledge-certifying function and replace it by this kind of war on, you know, all violence and oppression and, you know, the, the, the term violence having been, uh, you know, reformulated to refer to hurting someone's feelings, um, you know, then we're talking about that's a successor ideology, right? We've crossed over the barrier to saying, oh, there are these like illegitimate hierarchies of race and gender that we have to struggle against to saying that, no, actually like re empirical reality is a kind of oppression and, and we must not acknowledge it. Um, and so, you know, this was my kind of analysis of, of, you know, of, of what the new, another term for it that I find very useful, of, of the new post-liberal progressivism, um, you know, stands for. Um, and it's, and, and it's an all-encompassing view, uh, uh, that, that says that, like, you know, racial difference and, and also the gender binary itself, 
right, is a form of yeah, oppression. You called it a, a totalizing view. It's totalizing in that it encompasses everything, and therefore you can't really even have a discussion or argument outside of its bounds, which inevitably actually proves that you are part of the oppressor class or that you've adopted these oppressive beliefs. So it's it's like inescapable once you start going down that pathway. Right. And so, you know, what the successor ideology does, it says that like differential outcomes on tests, right? The existence of a gender binary, uh, the existence of police and prisons, it's a kind of abolitionism. And it, it kind of mm-hmm. musters the same energy uh, of the first abolitionists on behalf of attacks on societal institutions and distinctions in value and merit without which society can't function. Uh, it's at that point that it becomes a successor ideology because like in the, in the 1840s, you have to think about, you know, who the abolitionists were and what they were perceived as, right? The abolitionists were the most advanced people of their time. They were fervent Christian believers. Uh, you know, they, they, they were annoying as hell to the people that were comfortable with the status quo of the time. But they said that there's an urgent moral emergency in our midst that must be ended at any cost. And of course, it was correct. And that judgment turned out to be right because human bondage is not, uh, you know, uh, consistent with, um, with, with uh, you know, Christian belief in the divinity of all souls. Um, and, it, the, you know, the, the cost of ending it turned out to be, you know, the bloodiest civil war the, the country had ever seen. But we live on the other side of it. And we understood that it was a real marginal emergency. It had to end and it had to be ended at any cost. And now we talk about redefining. Now we have a class of people who derive their livings from finding new great moral emergencies that must be fought at any cost. And one of those great moral emergencies that must be fought at any cost is now the existence of, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a gender binary. Um, and and in fact, they have managed to get our institutions to to sign on right to, to that belief. And they've done it through. A mimetic process, a process that involves almost no thought, <laughs> a process that, that involves almost no sort of critical scrutiny, even though they use the term critical, right? Uh, because if anybody thought about it and, and, and those who do think about it uh, inevitably move in the direction of what is now called heterodoxy, but, but, but what is in fact, it is heterodoxy by virtue of the fact that the institutions have right, moved in the direction of rejecting empirical reality. And so to persist in empirical reality is now a form of heterodoxy. And when that turns out to be the case, you are, our our, our sort of uh, knowledge-forming institutions are already in crisis. And so to just be on Twitter is to see and, and to, to, to be on Twitter and to chronicle this process um, you know, by which our institutions are inducted into an anti-empirical, right, anti-scientific mindset, but to have the organs of scientific validation, right, themselves captured in the process. So, so you see, you know, sort of peer-reviewed journals, right, like, uh, you know, turning out, uh, you know, turning out, there, there was a, a great article, um, where, uh, you know, sort of looking at like gender and race bias. Um, and it was, a, there was a $400,000 grant from the National Science Foundation. And, and you had this woman, you know, she, she wrote this long sort of, um, uh, kind of self criticism of herself as a privileged white woman. And then there was, you know, and, and then you, you looked at the study for which the, you know, the taxpayer paid $400,000. And it turned out to be the case that there was like a, a whiteboard and then that, that a man was writing on. And then you had these women looking at it. And then there was just like an analysis of this and that proved the existence of gender bias. Um, and not that inconsistent with like a lot of that kind of thing that is now deemed to be scholarship and the citations upon which we are able to claim things such as like, there is a, Oh, there's a consensus on behalf of gender affirming care, even though, when Western, uh, when Northern European social democracies uh, review the same evidence, they reach a very different conclusion. And uh, more than one of those entities do it. They reach the conclusion that, in fact, and and here I'm quoting, uh, you know, a recent post by Lisa Sellen Davis, where she talked to the 
psychologist who was responsible for doing the overall review of puberty blockers and other forms of gender affirming care. And the psychologist who Finland had uh, deputized for this purpose said, oh, in fact, you know, we did the, we, we looked at all the evidence and there's, there's none, right? Like evidence mm-hmm. on behalf of gender affirming care for minors uh, is essentially non-existent. You have like a bunch of studies. They're all so weak that they count for nothing. Um, and, and so, so this process of ideological capture is more advanced in the uh, on this issue than in any other issue, and so because this was my interest, I naturally gravitated uh, gravitated toward it. When did you gravitate towards it? Because uh, as I was saying before, before we started, I've been waiting for you, <laughs> you, you know, the great thinkers who who were thinking very much about this subject in other contexts, like race primarily and uh, another context and I was like where why aren't they coming in on the gender where are they (laughs) and I'm thrilled you've arrived but what was the reluctance for people to arrive and do you think many more are coming after you because I believe they are well so at the very beginning um to me, it was just like, oh, this is another one of these critical social justice crazy things. And I think that's how people first perceived it. I noticed back in 2014 that like Germaine Greer, you know, was being protested, uh, you know, and, you know, called, uh, you know, a genocidal bigot. And, and so it was like a funny little bit of, uh, you know, zany social justice, uh, craziness, right? And that's how I think most people perceived it. Um, and we have these like two like crazy factions, right? Going at it. And, you know, it's like a bit comic, right? And, and I think that's how most people perceived it. Um, and, and then, but like, Things kept happening. <laughs> and for me, uh, a big moment was when Elizabeth Warren, right, in a 2019 or 2020 at the, uh, at the LGBTQ debate, uh, told a nine year old uh, transgender boy, right, that um, she was going to give him veto power over her choice for the uh, Secretary of Education. Um, and then Even before that, she started to use like pregnant people, people who menstruate. And so I would flag these things and I would tweet them and be like, hey, what's going on here? What's this all about? And um, this this is ostensibly a serious candidate for the presidency uh, using this Tumblr speak. And I hadn't even sort of been familiar with it on Tumblr, but I knew that it was this kind of, you know, this this bizarre invented new language. Um, and I hadn't really connected it at that time to what was going on with children, with what we now know was going on with children. Um, but I saw that it was scaling up. I saw that it was being embraced by uh, major figures within the, within the Democratic Party. And it was really only when Lisa Selen Davis appeared on the scene, uh, you know, not that long ago, right? Like speaking. Um, Speaking, um, you know, speaking about her sort of conversion, right, um, you know, to seeing the importance of this issue, because she she's the author of a book about having a gender nonconforming daughter. She wrote a book called Tomboy about it. And I had her on my call in show where she talked about how she kept hearing these rumors about like gay kids being trans, autistic kids being trans, about the lack of gatekeeping, um, that it really kind of all came together for me. And I saw, oh, this is like an, uh, this is an urgent moral question because we have, you know, we, we have these, um, we have these terrible things happening and we have those who want to stand against it. Uh, being called Nazis and fascists. Um, and, you know, all, all of this is, you know, like deeply indecent because, um, because there's, there's absolutely no basis for it. We're talking about parents for the most part who, who are Democrats or lifelong progressives whose children have been inducted into an online cult. Um, and I, and I saw the, the, you know, the deep indecency of the way they were being treated and the fact that they were being, uh, suppressed. And so like, even when like Jesse single was, <coughs> you know, a kind of object of online scorn and lies and attacks, I still didn't really see, you know, sort of my entry into this issue. Um, because, you know, whenever you have an issue like this, you know, that it's going to take over your life. Um, and you're going to, and you're going to, and you're going to pay an enormous price 
because he was demonstrating the enormous price that was going to be exacted of anyone who said anything uh, other than. So I didn't feel that I had grounds to speak up. And so I often tweet about the fact that I'm not that courageous. If I get around to the issue, it's because it's like really crystal clear that I'm on solid ground. I'm not going to do it for any other reason. And so what really launched me into this was what happened in Sweden and Finland. And once I learned about what happened in those places, I saw that we have cover for this, right? Like there is something that you can point to. It was a million times harder to make this argument, even though it was true in 2018 and 2019, million times harder when you didn't have that to point to. When that happened, I knew that there was a breach and that, and that, and that people are going to have to run through that breach. And so like for, for each of us, there is always just kind of like a little moment that sort of crystallizes like a dawning realization. And for me, it was a post on uh, the substack of, uh, of uh, the, 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 t- the tweeter, Eliza Mondegreen. Uh, she did a post about... Um, she did a post about trans exceptionalism and kids. And she has a sentence in that post where she says, trans kids are ordinary kids, right? That, you know, they're not the vanguard of humanity. They're not going to usher in a new future. They're not an exception to everything we know about what children needs in terms of their guidance. Uh, just because somebody is saying they're trans does not mean that they have any more agency than we accord children who are 12, 11, 13, uh, about irreversible, life-changing uh, health decisions than we would otherwise. Uh, they're not some, and for me, that was a kind of, I don't know, just like a sentence that kind of cracked open, you know, what I understood. And and I didn't even know at that time the extent to which, um, you know, the the hospitals were acting on this, you know, sort of newly manufactured consensus around gender-affirming care. And, and only recently did I find out that between the years 2017 and 2020, Boston Children's Hospital, you know, they put it in a journal article, you know, did chest surgeries on, uh, you know, 64 uh, girls. Um, and so this consensus was reached a while ago. It was reached in the mid 2010s and they began acting on it and they did it under cover of darkness. And and it's a kind of weird undercover of darkness because they were publicizing it on their own websites, but nobody else knew about it. And and recently people have been finding out about it and they've been finding out about it because these dogmas and these doctrines have started to filter into people's schools and, and they're filtering into people's schools. Parents are noticing it. They're noticing that their children in sometimes in the earliest years are being told that they have a gender identity and they can be male, female, both or neither on the basis of, uh, you know, their uh, subjective feeling that is untethered from their, you know, morphology or their, or their uh, genetics or the gametes that their bodies produce. Um, and this is, a, this is a fairy tale and this is a falsehood and this is actually a lie. And it's a lie that is being made systematically, turned into a dogma, treated as truth and laying the groundwork for an enormous expansion of a social contagion that we're already seeing on the basis of a peer-to-peer online uh, you know, phenomenon. So that enormous expansion that we've seen in transgender identity, where we're seeing 4,000% increases in those who are showing up at gender clinics uh, in Britain, um, uh, you know, is mostly the function of people who were influenced by their peers and by online influencers. But if you add in the school telling you these things are facts, Right. Uh, from the earliest years, you're going to, you know, you're going to multiply that contagion by a factor of, of 10, a factor of 100. You know, God knows, uh, you know, what it's actually going to turn out to be. Um, and so one of the things that I learned <laughs> while I was, uh, you know, one of the things that I've been learning, I, I recently did a post at my Substack, which was a guest post by a public school teacher in a blue city who describes, you know, not he's a math teacher, but. You know, the, the, there he doesn't have a class with fewer than two trans-identified uh, girls in it, um, and he has a couple of students who are on puberty blockers, and a couple, you know, and he has at least well, you know, one student who has had, uh, you know, a, you know, a double mastectomy in in high school. These things are all normalized, uh, and and there is a whole culture cheerleading them on the path to it. Um, he witnesses it, and he knows that he is not able to intervene. Right. Even though he's somebody who has a, you know, who has a kind of a, a prior trans identification and then and then sort of was persuaded by 
uh, gender critical blogs to take a more gender critical view, mostly on feminist grounds. Um, and, uh, but you know, he knows that it would be, it would be courting the end of his career to say anything about it. Therefore he has to write about it anonymously. And I have, you know, I'm sure you know all these facts better than I do, but I have, I have, uh, you know, I've interviewed multiple people who tell me things like, you know, 30% of the girls in my, you know, in my son's eighth grade class, you know, are trans identified of some sort or the other. And, you know, we, we can assume that only a minority of them are going to be put on the path of gender affirming care. Um, but the, but the, but the whole weight of the culture and also increasingly of the law is on the side of those who want to push those kids along that pipeline. Um, are they, are they really going to understand, you know, what the, uh, you know, the long-term side effects are when they're dealing with clinicians who have uh, an interest in, in suppressing, uh, you know, that knowledge from them? We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high-quality content for this show, and we're grateful to Rhyme and Genspect for supporting us. RIME, or Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics, is a non-profit organization dedicated to improving long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. And Genspect is an international alliance of parents and professional groups whose aim is to advocate for parents of gender-questioning children and young people. If you'd like to become a patron, you'll have access to weekly transcripts and special Q&As, and you can join our listener community. Now back to the show. Could I ask you, because you, you've kind of come in with new eyes because you come from a different place, as in, you know, I mean, we came in, let's say, from psychology, you come in from kind of the societal point of view. And I know you did a tour with Billboard Chris, and I'm, di- I'm dying to hear what what you kind of made of all that. But um, it's kind of hiding in plain sight, this phenomenon. More than hiding in plain sight, it's it's really been shoved at us. And yet there's an extraordinary kind of, like you say, it's happening. We all know it's happening. And then we're still shocked when we actually see the details of what's going on. Have you ever seen a, a phenomenon similar? Because I suppose I'm very interested to know how how people like you who are seeing it with new eyes, I would argue, and also from a, a larger perspective, how it will pan out. Because let's say if you look at some other kind of phenomena that have happened, I don't see any equivalent. I don't see an equivalent that's ever happened. And so it, it, you it's have, really you hard have, to know. Yeah. You have, bit, you have bits and pieces of antecedents, right? We have kind of like recovered memory uh, syndrome, right? And, the, and there were people who, uh, and, you know, as recently as like 19, in the 1990s, they did a poll of clinicians, psychologists, and I think 90% of them believed it was real. But you still had a functioning press back then, and you had and you had enough space within academia for a heterodox person on this issue to be able to prove, right, um, in the face of all of the cultural energy and pressure on this issue, that no, in fact, right, there isn't any basis to believe this is real, right, um, and and the press was able to serve as a check. Um, and so this is an argument that, you know, it's kind of Lisa Selen Davis makes, right? Like this happened, you know, in Sweden, um, you know, they, they did a documentary where they found, you know, ins- inadequate gatekeeping and they found, uh, they, and they found regrets and they found, and they found clinicians who were uh, fanatical members of a cult pushing, uh, you know, pushing their patients into it. Um, and as there was public outrage and, and then there was a, you know, a reversal of their policy. And so if something like that by sort of, you know, one of America's major press outlets were to come out, that ought to be a similar kind of phenomenon, but that thing is not allowed. Um, and it is now being done by, uh, partisan media. And so this is the thing that I kept talking to Chris about because Chris sort of, um, you know, Chris is Chris is happily, uh, you know, courting, uh, you know, uh, f- f- fairly right wing members of the House, and he's not actually that informed about them. He's, he, his policy is he's going to talk to anyone, uh, and he's going to talk to anyone. And he's going to tell them true facts, and he's going to make a really reasonable pitch. And he's done that in all of the, of the places that we've gone to. So he went on Marjorie Taylor Greene's podcast, and he made a very reasonable pitch. 
And if she is informed by him, she's going to go around, she's going to be repeating some of his points, and those points are going to be empirically correct, reasonable, and based in fact. But because she's saying it, those very empirically correct, moderate, and reasonable points are going to be, be, be perceived by half of the country as paranoid, uh, right-wing conspiracy theory. Um, and so that this is, uh, you know, I, I asked him about this a dozen times over the course of seven days, and he was always consistent in saying, this is going to cross partisan lines because people have families that are cross partisan. And my goal is just to get as many people in absolute terms to know about what's going on. And, and so I'm going to use any outlet that is available to me. Um, and that's a strategic choice that he's made and I could see how it might work. And I can also see how it might backfire spectacularly. I don't know the answer. Uh, but many people who are sort of politically progressive immediately recoil against that kind of strategy. Um, and I understand why they recoil against that kind of strategy because when you're here, because people, you know, people, because the country is so polarized along partisan lines. And so if this, perce- if this perceives to be a Marjorie Taylor Greene slash Lauren Boebert slash, right, like Trumpist uh, kind of issue, then the medical institutions and the, you know, all of which have a progressive slant um, are going to, it's going to be much harder to bring them to heel. And, and so you have all of these people that will not have conversations with that half of the country. And he makes a very, you know, a very cogent, sorry, I don't know if it's persuasive, but he makes a very cogent, you know, sort of case that we have to speak to the whole country uh, and we have to do it without, you know, sort of fear or favor. Part of this is the fact that he's Canadian. So he's not quite as embedded, you know, within the partisan uh, passions of the United States. So, but, you know, the things that I basically learned from him is like he made a series of claims about what it's like when he goes out on the street wearing his billboard saying, you know, no child can consent to puberty blockers and, you know, um, and no child is wrong, born in the wrong body. So he puts himself in a sandwich board. He looks like a crazy person. However, he makes sure to he makes sure to dress very natally in order to counteract the effect of the sandwich board uh, and and he and he goes on to various street corners. Uh, I went with him to the Lincoln Memorial and I went with him to um, Brown university. And uh, you know, there's a couple, there's a few things that he tells me, which is first of all, that like the people who say positive things toward him versus those who say negative is like nine to one. And that turned out to be right. Right. Like almost everybody, everywhere we walked around Washington, DC, people would say, amen, brother, you're doing, you know, God's work. People of all, you know, a guy from Qatar was like, yeah, you know, you have a lot of fans in Qatar. Um, and you know, like black guys come up to him and are like, yes, absolutely. You know, and, and, but there's one demographic that always hisses at him and curses at him. And that is women under the age of 25. And so, uh, and so this is the, you know, in a way, the reason a private citizen who did not have access to, uh, you know, who did not have access to the media or, um, you know, uh, decided to uh, give himself the only platform that he could give, which was to walk around North uh, North American cities having conversations one on one with people while wearing a sandwich board. Do you remember Hans Falada from Alone in Berlin? Do you remember that book? Yes. Um, it's a classic book from the war. And he, he, he went around Berlin during the war years giving postcards, putting postcards. He always makes me think of Alone in Berlin. He's doing the same thing in a different way. Like, Yeah. And, and so, uh, so, you know, the reason is, he, you know, he, he's like in a way that this is already lost. We have to try to win it back. But it's lost because it's institutionalized. It's in the schools. And we're seeing among people under the age of 25, mostly girls, um, that, uh, that they just accept the – the premises of gender ideology is axiomatic. And, uh, and, and so all you can do is kind of have conversations with them where you try to open a little space of, uh, you know, sort of cognitive dissonance in them. And he's, he's a very effective communicator. And so I have this long 24 minute video where he is talking to uh, a young woman and it's like a kind of Twitter exchange brought to life where she is, you know, she denies that any surgeries are happening and, you know, he, you know, we don't, we're not able to dispute it. Uh, but like, in fact, we, we all know that they are happening. Um, and, uh, you know, he's not able to, uh, 
Um, but you know, he, he, she's, she's willing to engage for about 20 minutes. And then at the end of it, this, uh, you know, this black veteran in a, in a Navy hat, uh, you know, sort of interrupts, uh, interrupts the exchange and is like, listen, you know, everything he's saying is correct. Um, and, and so what one sees is that like the, you know, the vast supermajority of the country agrees essentially with what Chris believes, which is that like, it's not appropriate to be giving, to be medicalizing children. And he's very careful to say that that is the extent of his critique. You know, if, as an adult, you want to make your own choices, that's fine. Um, but we're talking about ir- irreversible medical intervention in children. Um, children are not in a position where they can consent to that kind of thing, uh, uh, especially when they're in the process of being, you know, p- propagandized by the whole culture. Um, that, that he just has this one claim that kids can't medicalize. And for the most part, people agree with him. One simple claim. For the most part, almost everybody yeah. agrees with him. Um, yeah. uh, but there is, there is a part of society that disagrees with him. And so, like, you know, you have this kind of claim. That there is this problem. You have these kind of young women kind of telling turfs. You don't represent us. We don't agree with you. These arguments that you're making on behalf of the harm to women, um, we want we want those things, <laughs> right? Like we want men in our bathrooms. We want men in our locker rooms. We want men playing sports on us. The people who are saying that more than anybody else are the actual young women. And, and, and they, the reason why they are the ones is because the peer-to-peer phenomenon happened to them and because it got into the schools. And and so this is like a a major problem about the way that we have to think about this, um, be, because the young women are telling their kind of turf elders, "We reject you," and there are so few of you relative to us in our cohort, and that's true. And so that, this is a major problem. And the argument made on behalf of all these harms to women and girls, it's the women and girls who are cheering them on more than anything else. Um, and that's a kind of like datum that I saw demonstrated, you know, before my eyes. So there are those, and then. The other thing is, is that you have these young, aggressive, you know, sort of Antifa affiliated males um, who just kind of want to have, uh, you know, a reason to scrap and to go out on the street and to and to get in and to get into physical confrontations with people based upon who the mainstream media is telling them is a Nazi. And of course, today I posted, you know, a video of this, uh, you know, of this uh, very sweet, very small, uh, you know, middle ages woman who was present at the uh, debate saying, you know, I have I have an ROGD daughter. I have a 15-year-old girl who has been taken in by these things. And I did my own research and I looked at the evidence and I saw that it, that medicalization you know, is not, you know, the right choice for us. And they're under tremendous pressure, legal and otherwise, uh, but, you know, mostly cultural to put her on a path that they truly believe is harmful. And for this, she has a hundred people under the age of 25 across the street calling her a Nazi. And the mayor of Boston joining in saying these are far right protesters engaged in a, a campaign of intimidation against hospitals when in fact the police presence was there to protect the 12 people who are willing to show their face showing enormous courage um, because they are in danger of being doxxed, of being, of, of having their, you know, their employment attacked, of having child protective services called on them. Uh, All lifelong liberals um, who are struggling with the fact that they've looked at the evidence, the same evidence that Finland and Sweden and France and the UK looked at and said, this program that is being pushed on us of medicalization is not right for our children and we're going to protect our children against it um and and in the course of protecting our children we're being called child abusers and we're being called fascists right um and including by our own mayor and including by the president of the united states of america who says that gender affirming care for trans kids is a moral imperative and those who stand in the way of it are part of the semi-fascist uh, threat to this country. So the, the, the kind of the obscenity, right, of the way this is, this is being framed, of the way good people who have looked at the evidence and who care about their children are being framed in this partisan game that the president has no understanding of, but is willing to be a party to, um, is, is to me just one of the most uh, shocking and horrifying things happening into the country. And so this kind of pathos 
um, and, and, and the, the, the drive to tell that story as a journalist and to tell it as it really is and to persuade people of what the reality actually is. I've had not really had this kind of crusading passion about anything uh, prior to this because, you know, my, my, my attitude is, is that I'm a, something of a gadfly and, uh, you know, a kind of. Uh, you know, a kind of de- detached observer, uh, you know, of the, the, you know, of late imperial decline, um, who sort of, you know, for the most part tweets and writes, you know, pretty detached and, uh, you know, sarcastic, uh, views of things. But on this issue, when I see that woman, speaking about her love for her daughter and her wish for her to express her gender in any way she wishes, but to protect her against, uh, y- y- medical interventions that have lifelong and serious um, uh, health consequences, and to have that person framed in this way, uh, to me, I just want to scream, have you no decency at all those people? And not just at those people, but to the ones who stand behind them, is because you have all these like kind of radical street brawlers who are in perfect alignment with the corporations and with the medical establishment and with the president of the United States and with the mayor of Boston, all of whom are willing to, or, you know, not even really knowing, sacrifice the bodies of thousands of children in order to have a partisan talking point, in order to portray themselves as the vanguard of humanity and as, uh, as the saviors of children, when, in fact, you know, they're in the process of subjecting them to what I think a decade from now we will all recognize to have been an incredible, you know, one of the greatest medical scandals. So your question was, do we have precedent for it? We have piecemeal parts of it, but we've never had total capture of all of our ruling institutions in the way that we have. We've never been able to roll up under the banner of civil rights, right? Like the whole infrastructure of, of, of law and of policy and of administration and of uh, medicine in the way that we have on this issue. And so, you know, I'm, I'm writing an essay right now called, you know, Transgenderism, the Highest Stage of um, Successor Ideology. Um, all of the different elements of a non-electoral politics of institutional capture that takes activist um, professionals and professional activists working in concert with each other in order to capture the organs of power and control within our society in order to, uh, you know, to bring about a desired result that portrays itself as being, uh, you know, at the vanguard of humanity and our fight against violence and oppression, but that in fact rules out the kind of critical scrutiny to ask, in fact, whether we are doing good or doing harm, right? Transgenderism is furthest advanced in all of these things. And, and, and what's so fascinating, you know, from the perspective of the, of the theorist of successor ideology is that precisely because it's a category that anybody can identify into, that in demographic terms effectively doesn't even really exist, right? Like it's so small in number, but that can be redefined as something that anyone can identify into and then ally themselves with a socio-political cultural juggernaut um, makes it a kind of pure invention of political correctness in a way that the the actual existence of other groups is a sort of is a kind of break right on, on on making them like a pure entity of power and having this be a pure entity of power makes them a kind of ideal subject and of course we'll We're going to create other populations along these terms. We're already talking about eunuch identity at WPATH. Um, and so, and, and so we have a class of people who are committed to the continual manufacture of a treadmill of new forms of oppression that we can declare ourselves to be fighting against. And once you have untethered yourself entirely from any uh, biological uh, constraint or determination, and it simply becomes a matter of self identification that cannot be questioned. Right, so that you have the shop teacher putting on gi- gigantic prosthetic breasts that are clearly a part of a, uh, a paraphilia, right? That he is inflicting upon his students, and yet the board of education is unable to do anything but affirm and defend him against parents who see this as inappropriate and therefore are fascists, right? Like manufacturing this crisis out of nothing. This is a dynamic that can go on forever. 
I wait, <laughs> we have to stop <laughs> this dynamic going on forever. Do you think we might be reaching it? <laughs> she says Stella Tigger like <laughs> poignantly. Might we be reaching a climax insofar as the 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 the, the, the person with those mass of that prosthetic breast disaster in that school it, re- it really was pretty shocking we'll, ha- we'll have to include that for listeners yeah. who aren't on twitter i mean it's really unbelievable <laughs> it's, it's, it's a shocking shocking demonstration of of it's a, a, culture. It's a male teacher who's wearing prosthetic breasts that are like unbelievably gigantic and it's just so obscene and grotesque and, and when, part of a sex t- act when parents complained the school basically doubled down and said we support our you know, gender diverse teachers. So it is, it's reached a level of absurdity that I, I love Stella's question. Are we reaching a tipping point where people can no longer just kind of hide behind the the veil of we're standing up for our civil rights here? Like, is there a tipping point? What do you think? Well, I mean, they're, they're already putting, uh, you know, murderers and rapists in, pri- uh, in female prisons simply on the basis of self-identification. So, we keep having these reductio ad absurdums, like one after the next. Almost every week seems to bring a new one. Yeah. Um, and and so what that does is it creates awareness in the public. And so, so like, you know, the, the New York Times, they wrote a piece about a uh, uh, a serial murderer of women who was, uh, who was uh, apparently he was free. I don't exactly know why he was free, but he was allowed into a... Uh, a domestic violence shelter for women uh, on the basis of his self-identification as a woman, even though the identification I think happened at the age of 80. So he'd spent a lifetime as a man and he had, he had serially murdered women. Uh, and therefore the women in the shelter did not want to share space with a serial murderer of women. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, vic- uh, victims of domestic violence and of uh, violence by men might have, uh, y- you know, a kind of, um, Hesitance to, 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 to be to be sheltered along with a serial murder of women, um, and so what the Times did was they quoted someone saying, uh, you know, a member of the staff saying, "Why is are the feelings of a serial murder of women more important than the safety of the women on whose behalf we exist?" And so they have the quote, but they're continually referring throughout the whole body of the article to the male serial murder of women who recently identified as trans as a woman and by she pronouns. And so what that does is it kind of throws into high relief to everybody, right? The absurdity, uh, but also the fact that we as an organ that is committed to this overall regime of representation um, are still going to obey the absurd rules that have been imposed upon us, right? Um, and that seems to be the kind of cul-de-sac that we are in at the moment. The school board has to defend the giant breast and doesn't have, can't come up with a reason to to, to say the common sense of, par- uh, of parents must prevail. And in fact, they're, they, they must, not only are they not able to say that, <clears throat> they must say the parents are anti-LGBTQ and we stand against bigotry and hate, right? And it's like, well, how long can that last? Uh, uh, um, continually uh, those who express any kind of dissent find themselves deplatformed and so recently gays against groomers you know it's a it's a provocative framing but it's also a very much to the point framing right um uh you know paypal uh will not allow them to accept money so all of the entities that control our tech and finance stack have made it clear whose side they are on and they are not on the side of those who would say hey you know uh you know uh 36 uh double z breasts uh, on a man are not appropriate in class they are on the side of those who would say those who would make that point those who would argue against it do not deserve the right to speak and do not uh, do not deserve to participate uh in our economy and cannot raise money on their own behalf. Um, and, and so you have these attacks that go beyond the, um, uh, the platform level, right? They go beyond the Twitter level. They're, they're going to the, to, to the sub, they're going to the, uh, you know, the sub, the, the infrastructural level, right? And so what happened with uh, Kiwi Farms, right? A very toxic website, but 
not more toxic than a lot of other websites, including Twitter, where a lot of toxic things happen, where people get doxxed and people are viciously mocked and people's livelihoods are routinely attacked. Um, you know, uh, so what they did was they managed to get the company that provides security against uh, online denial of service attacks that end up. And so what they're doing is, is they're removing what they're doing is they're removing protection against crime. For those who are judged to be disfavored entities that, that, that speak against, right, the, the ruling consensus. And that ruling consensus doesn't just include people that we all agree are bad, white, white nationalists, white supremacists, uh, Nazis, but gender critical women have been, have been put, uh, you know, sort of in, uh, on par with those groups and are treated as such. By the uh, by, those who control your ability to get a message out, and so, can't, so your question is like: Is there going to be a tipping point? Maybe yes, but it's going to happen by virtue of a process that, in in much the same way that the capture is unprecedented in the extent, the the pushback is going to be have to also be unprecedented, and and God knows how it's going to happen, and 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 people like uh, Billboard Chris are saying, you know, we we you know we have to deal with the rights. Um, and there are a lot of people who are afraid to do that. And he's taking that step. And we're going to see whether he's going to wake more people up or whether he's going to um, uh, just get deplatformed because he's going to be associated with uh, these people who are already existing on thin ice like Marjorie Taylor Greene. So you see what I mean? It's yeah. like, so so is he, and, and is he just going to provide uh, ammunition for those who are going to say this sweet old uh, lady here who's trying to defend her daughter, right? Well, affiliated with this person who went on Tucker Carlson, therefore she, yo, she is far right, right? Even though she clearly is a lifelong progressive. Um, so the, the, clearly all of those attempts are going to be made. The question is, as people learn the truth, as they're exposed to reality, is there going to be a kind of silent consensus that then some reasonable common sense politician is going to be able to generate, be able to mobilize on their behalf? Right. Like uh, put themselves in a position of power where they're going to be able to restore sanity right onto institutions that have that 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 are so captured by a social process. Right. And, and they're captured not by the law. They're captured by they're captured by peer pressure um, and they're, they're willing to do things that because the people who still are in charge are still normal people who are being pushed by their junior employees and who can't find a way to say no to them because the social pressure on them is so great that there is no opening for them to say no actually you know we're not going to we're not going to add the pronouns right to the uh, to the intake form and it's like we're seeing that those who control the intake forms you know exert a tremendous amount of uh, you know, influence on our reality. They are making it so that you cannot apply for a job, uh, you know, apply for a university without declaring your allegiance to the ideology. Whether you understand the full implications of what you're doing or not, uh, you have said that I am a man by virtue of the fact of my identification as a he, him. And they're getting you to do that time after time. And they're making it so that you cannot participate in society without having done that. And having done that a certain number of times, whether or not you ever believed or you ever agreed, cognitive dissonance is hard to deal with. And what people tend to do is they tend to align their beliefs with the actions that they're being forced to take. And by mm. virtue of this process, a whole cohort of women under the age of 25 oh, have God. been inducted into a set of beliefs. And as they grow into, uh, you know, positions of authority uh, throughout society, th there doesn't seem to be any way for them not to be able to continue this process unless a contrary social process, unprecedented in its scale, as yet, uh, you know, unknown in what form it takes, arrests that process because the institutions that generate the intake forms that generate the, um, you know, the, um, you know, the basic way that we bureaucratically structure things, they've already been fully captured. And they're, and, and now we just see a kind of infill of a conclusion that they've already reached whenever, for example, the house of representative does something like take the words, mother, father, brother, sister, right out of the official language uh, to be used in legislation. That's something that they did. Um, and so that we know that any democratic administration, 
um, is going to, you know, if they win again in uh, 2024 or if they return to power in 2028, they will immediately begin this process because this process is a core part of the the kind of uh, bureaucratic uh, constituency that is at the heart of who staffs them and who mans them. And so like, so like a prerequisite, a basic prerequisite doesn't mean that it's going to happen of like the kind of unprecedented rollback that I'm talking about is like 16 years of capture, uh, right, of, of the political system by those who have a clear idea of what it means to roll back these changes and to do it in the face of, you know, uh, you know, uh, being called Nazis every day, uh, it, it, you know, it, in the mainstream media, simply because they want to recognize empirical reality. Wow. That is uh, giving us an awful lot of food for thought. Um, yeah. um, it's 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 kind of distressing, to be honest. I I do think the counterculture, what you said, maybe myself and you, Sasha, you, you we've talked about maybe the children that are coming up are starting to talk about being queer without medicalization. <laughs> yeah, well, they are they are doing that. That's definitely happening. Yes. that's definitely happening. Yes, yeah. and so what's going to happen is. Um, it, it is still a relatively small percentage. Those who are, you know, neurodivergent, who have like real problems, who, who, who are being sold on medicalization. And then there's the larger social contagion of those who are, you know, who just want to like fit in and, and, and be trendy, who adopt a queer identity for some amount of time. Right. And, you know, so the data that I'm, you know, the sort of anecdote data that I'm getting from kids, you know, who attend progressive schools in the Bay Area is that it's just like, it's just very uncool to be straight. <laughs> and, yeah. and, yeah. um, and so, uh, you know, uh, an argument that the teacher that I wrote about makes in his piece based upon his own observations of the school, and it, it can vary dr- dramatically from one school to the next. Uh, it's a pretty progressive school in a pretty blue city. Uh, you know, what he argues is that, is that maybe in the past, this kind of sort of turf argument about uh, transing away the gay uh, might have been true about young kids. But now what we're seeing is that it, being being trans is a way for straight kids to be gay rather than that's a way right. for gay kids to yeah. be straight. Yeah. And so yeah, in a way, a, great piece. a lot yeah. of its content is being leached out from it. Um, and then it's just a kind of trendy thing that kids do. And now we see like, you know, like 20% of Gen Z or maybe even more identifies as some form of queer, but you know, th- you know, they're, but for the most part are not engaging in same sex activity and are not medicalizing themselves. Um, and so that, that process is happening, but the medicalization is still happening. And of course, you know, WPATH just stripped out any age guidelines, uh, you know, from, from their, from their guidelines and they're moving on to eunuch identities and uh, which will involve medicalization. And so, and so, th- so that is an interest of people who are committed to the ever expansion of market opportunities for themselves to do surgeries on people. And, and the, they're not going to stop uh, and, and uh, they're not going to stop on the basis of the, you know, they've had some whistleblowers from their ranks who've gone to the press and said, there isn't actually any gatekeeping going on anymore. And so they have done that, but that, that doesn't mean anything because one of the people who did go to the press and say, ah, you know, there's a problem, uh, you know, Marcy Bowers, who's, who's the new president yeah. did stand on the stage and g- join in a standing ovation to a bunch of protesters who are like, these guidelines that have no age limits are far too restrictive. Right. Like everybody responded to that, you know, by giving them a, uh, a standing ovation and, and Marcy Bowers joined in. So I, I was surprised that Marcy Bowers joined in. I'll be honest. I, I had thought that she was trying to bring more caution into it, but yeah, well, we, uh, we, you know, she made some statements to that effect, but then mm-hmm. uh, in her first act as the president, uh, you know, w- we just went through the thing that we did. I'm sure there's people more expert than myself who can talk about this. Uh, but like, but what we saw was a shit show. That's yeah, good. and we're recording this kind of middle of September where WPATH guidelines just came out and then the very sudden uh, dropping of the age limit. So there is more to come. I'm sure we'll see a lot of kind of shocking and weird news unfolding in the coming months. Um, I know that it's probably it's probably time for us to wrap it up, but this has been fascinating and it's we're so we're so grateful that you have brought your energies and your mind to this topic and to hear your 
not only incredible insightfulness about this, but also your passion and your just willingness to put yourself out there is really, we're very grateful for your work and we're so glad to have your thoughts and your writing on this topic. Much needed and Yes, let, let, let me plug this up. Let me plug the Substack. Debates. Oh, yeah. Sure, uh, sure. So it's wesleyyang.substack.com. W-E-S-L-E-Y-Y-A-N-G.substack.com. And uh, I'm doing a lot of writing on trans identity. I'm going to do a lot more. I'm going to do a piece on Billboard Chris. Um, and, uh, and, and that piece, you know, it's about him, but it's also about – it's going to be my first – because I've been publishing a lot of other people on this subject, um, but I'm gonna, But it's going to be like the first time I weigh in directly, and I'm also going to write a couple of other pieces. One of them, a kind of theoretical piece about transgenderism as the highest form of successor ideology, and another yes, one that we'll is definitely plug that. And another one that is a public facing manifesto saying, you know, we're going to debate this thing. This is going to be yeah, part of yeah. a public debate because yeah. the New York Times put a lot of stuff on the record. They recognize that there is a real debate here, mm-hmm. and there and and what 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 Finland and and Sweden did uh, puts other things on the record, and uh, and the kind of uh, we're going to scrutinize the uh, manufactured consensus on behalf of gender affirming care, um, and it's not just going to happen in these heterodox publications. Like yeah. we're going to make it so that so that so that no one can avoid uh, having the overall societal debate, and I have no doubt. Where a, a free and open debate, uh, you know, what the outcome of it would be. Yes, that's all we ever needed right. was debate. Yeah, that's right. Thank you very, very much. That was absolutely powerful and yes. fairly inspiring too. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is sponsored by Rhyme and Genspect, and listener support means a lot to us. The best way to help is to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Follow us on social media, and if you'd like to become a patron, you'll have access to weekly transcripts of the show, special Q&As, and you can join our listener community. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash widerlenspod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services. 